We often say or think that one action or one object is more environmentally benign than another one. And you see an example here of framing the question. On the left, you see some of the beautiful ceramics that uh, Stieg Lindbergh designed for Gustav's bag in my time, and that many in the people in this room have used. And that right, you see a styrofoam cup. And the question is, which of these is better for the environment? Now, I'm going to try to talk bravely, not about my field, but about uh, facing up to this question. It's not only these things that the choices are made, it is often in the processes for complicated chemical reactions. For instance, polycarbonates are an important kind of plastic material. And here is a variety, some four or five different ways of making dimethyl carbonate, as it's called, which is the molecule that's in the middle of this in various ways. And what you see is the commercial or traditional process. And it involves a molecule called phosgene. That molecule is a poisonous gas. It was used as a uh, warfare material, chemical warfare material in its time. And it's used in a traditional process. And we have the gut feeling that that any process which avoids that molecule should be better. But we should reserve judgment on that. While the theoretical chemist that I am is totally unable to handle this material and other dangerous materials in the laboratory, there are 10 to the 6 tons of phosgene being used commercially in this world. And you don't hear very often in the newspapers of accidents with that particular molecule. Though peripherally, one was involved in one of the major chemical disasters of this world, and that was the Bhopal disaster in India some time ago. We are able to handle dangerous materials. Still, it would be good to avoid such things. So what I want to share with you is a dream, a dream of some index, uh, a face of green, I would call it, a multifaceted index, and the multifaceted matters a lot, which is a reasonable and compassionate and socially um, conscious, sensitive measure of the consequences of transformation. The multidimensional will become clear in a moment. Uh, the first part of it is going to be a transformation index, which is going to be based on the entropy and is related to the unrecoverable heat that is wasted in any natural process, useful or not useful. And the second part of it has to do with risk perception and also the contrast of that with risk assessment that is inherent in any of those objects. The chemical synthesis, the making of that polyurethane cup. And the third part is going to talk about potential societal costs, social costs of the transformation. I want to begin with a trouble that we all have. We are all unfortunately tied to the process of looking for number one and valuing that. And we want an index. We want a number. That number which tells us how that that cup is better than the other cup. The number can go up, the number can go down, but we're desperate for these numbers, whether it's the Nobel Prize or the Olympics that are about to come up, or 
something about the environmental value. This is testimony to the weakness of the human mind and nothing else. And so the moment I do this, I talk about an index, I feel guilty because I'm playing into that. I'm going to devise a number. And I want to voice here a wonderful sage philosopher and economist, Amartya Sen, uh, the best of economists, and what he has to say, he says the passion for aggregation, and what he means by aggregation is lumping everything together so that you get a number. That this passion for aggregation makes good sense in many contexts, but it can be futile or pointless in another. Let me begin by how I would begin a discussion of natural, unnatural, to get into this index based on the entropy. I mean, here are, at left, are two images, just symbolic of cotton, in the middle of nylon. Uh, I don't show a woman's stocking, I show a bag that is strong because it is made of nylon. And at the bottom I show a chemical synthesis, which right away a synthesis which even I, a theoretician, have done in the demonstration in the laboratory to show you that clearly nylon is a synthetic material and I can make it in the laboratory. And, and at right you see rayon. And you see, of course, a canonical image of a zoot suit a rayon-based clothing. But at lower right you see what makes rayon interesting to the textile industry, and that is a particularly lustrous, it was called in the 19th century, artificial silk. A particularly lustrous material, but one which is extremely strong. Now, if you ask people, what are cotton, rayon, or nylon? You get, I would say, the following answer. Cotton is clearly natural. You can see that. It's growing in that plant. Nylon is clearly artifactual, man or woman made, synthetic, unnatural. All words with different meanings, but with, uh, with different connotations, but all signifying actually the same thing. This is a human made material. And if you ask people what rayon is, uh, they usually don't know. Uh, they, but it is, there's a feeling that it's artifactual also. And it is. So let me tell you, but only in part. Uh, let me tell you what they are. This is one of the few chemical equations that you'll see from now on. Uh, there, uh, nylon is, in fact, a copolymer invention of the DuPont Company and William Carruthers in the 1930s. A polymer made from two pieces, all of which uh, are made alternating in a polymer, extremely strong as a result, and going back ultimately to petroleum and the products made from it. Cotton is essentially a polysaccharide. It has a chemical structure. Just because it's natural, it doesn't escape being a chemical. It is a chemical. It is, chemicals are everything, including you and me. And it is a, uh, a natural chemical cellulose, essentially. Now, what rayon is, rayon is actually also cellulose. It's very different from nylon. But it is originally has cellulose roots. In the 19th century, it came from discarded rags of cotton and other materials. It comes very often from a wood pulp source source today, and then it's manipulated chemically and Im improved in various ways over uh, what the natural cellulose is, uh, and it, then some of those improvements, chemical groups that are added to it, remain in, on top of the cellulose, but it's basically a modified cellulose material. It is definitely uh, a product in which human beings have intervened. Now, you have to look a little bit deeper because the cotton is grown. And it turns out that when you look a little bit deeper, that the 
agriculture of cotton is, if not the, certainly one of the most chemically intense agricultures there is, with the use of herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers uh, of the type that you've mentioned, the fertilizer that you've heard mentioned. And it is uh, those which allow it to grow, and I'll come back to it. And the, certainly, uh, the, nyl the nylon comes from petroleum, eventually, through chemical manufacture, modification, and the rayon involves chemical steps. Now, if you ask the question which I've put up here, by now you realize, of course, what is obvious, and that is everything in this world has natural origins. I mean, what else could there be? Something is not created from nothing. It's created ultimately from something natural. The petroleum is natural. And it was once a plant, an awful lot of plants. And it is there. And we can legitimately inquire. So these sources are all plant sources. Very efficient users of solar energies, you've heard. Now we can ask the question another way. Of the seeds of the plants which led to p nylon, cotton, and rayon eventually, which one of the seeds of those plants has the right to be called natural? In the sense of the seed of that plant never having been touched by human hands, never having received the benefit of human ingenuity, which are fertilizers, and it's only the nylon plant, the plant which led to nylon, which was never touched by human hands until much later on. Now, that's not the end, because there is clearly a feeling that there has been a lot more transformation to that plant that wound up in the petroleum, that wound up in the 10% of the petroleum that are chemical feedstocks, that wound up in the adipic acid and the other components of nylon. There is a feeling that there is much more transformation that human beings have done to that plant to make it into nylon. But that's a good discussion because you can begin then to talk and you can begin to think, could there be a measure of the transformation by which the labor and ingenuity of human beings has what it has accomplished with natural things? We have been put on this earth to transform it. And some people are unhappy about the fiat that both religion and science have given to us to do so. But we have done so. And uh, it's interesting to get a measure of that, and that's part of what I want to address. It. So what we want to talk about is some sort of separation distance or separation or distance of the material from its original natural origins. Now, there are some suppositions that have to go into this. One you see here, obviously, that chemical reactions are transformations of matter. Uh, some chemical reactions should proceed spontaneously, but yet they require activation energy. And what you heard in the last lecture was a, a brilliant tour through all the ways that we have found of reducing the energy that we need to put in in order to make reactions that in some anthropomorphic sense want to run downhill to help them overcome the barriers that they are there are there. The barriers are surely there. I assure you that we burn and not only with passion. What I mean by that is that every molecule in your body except for a few inorganic ones like carbonate and phosphate, in the presence of the oxygen, which has been with us for three billion years, is thermodynamically unstable. 
those molecules burn. Paper burns here. It takes a certain number of degrees Fahrenheit, and Ray Bradbury's book will tell you how many, to flash, to make the flash point of paper. That's thermodynamically downhill. Catalysts help us go that way. Still other reactions, though, run uphill thermodynamically, and for those, we definitely need the input of energy. So energy is required. I have already said this. At the beginning of anything, there is something natural. Uh, one interesting thing about human beings transforming matter is that human beings, desperate to, trans to categorize the things that we do as different from the things that nature does, to call some things natural and some unnatural, uh, that at the same time they're completely busy subverting the categories that they themselves define. And one of the ways they do this is they use living organisms, plants or animals, are often used in transformations. Here are some, some plants of the allium family. What would the world be like without onions or garlic? Uh, very boring. Uh, and uh, these now, a few uh, hectares of garlic growing wild is natural. A ton of garlic is not natural, it's agriculture. It's human beings transforming the natural and using it for our own purposes. And that causes some problems in our definitions. Every transformation requires materials, reactants and solvents, catalysis. It requires energy, it requires a place for the transformation. It requires human labor, not the counting the labor of machines here and it requires ingenuity to build the machines that replace our own labor. And so I'm going to talk about this reasonable index, uh, I hope, uh, as, and a sensitive index, uh, and I'm going to define it in terms of something, again, I, I come back to this, I cannot get away from this, the guilt that I feel at even talking about an index. Because, and it's in part the reason why it's multifaceted, you see? Because I'm going to try to come up with an index based on entropy, but the moment I say it, I'm going to uh, it show you two other parts of that index. So the first part has to do with the unrecoverable heat that's added to the universe, which is uh, uh, whatever you, it's, there is energy that's produced and stored in molecules as you make a chemical process, but there is more heat expanded than that minimum energy. And that is added to the universe, and it's usually put in terms of entropy. And entropy is a word, uh, though we, be, we have a feeling for it, which somehow has the feeling of something being scientific. And maybe its true understanding is beyond uh, that of the ordinary person, but it isn't. Uh, the entropy is a natural tendency to greater disorder, uh, to as much mixing as possible. And it is not, though it is often seen, as a contrary universe that somehow is opposed to our tendency, our desire to want order, but it's really democracy at the molecular level. Let me give you an example. Here are four books. When we put some books, let's say there are four volumes of, of, uh, of something, uh, and we order them in a certain order on our shelves. Okay, now nature knows nothing about our wanting the books in order one, two, three, four. Supposing we put the books on a shelf in order one, two, three, four, and then we let in a horde of monkeys into the room. Book reading monkeys, or at least book handling monkeys. And they will rearrange that order. And I've written here the combinatorics, the 24 different ways in which those four volumes can be lined up. Now, we want them one, two, three, four. Perhaps in a pinch we'll take four, three, two, one. 
but that's just two of the 24 ways. The universe doesn't care about what we want. So instead of monkeys, uh, well, there are molecules in motion. Uh, if we start out with uh, five red balls in the upper left-hand corner of this graph, if the balls are traveling freely, colliding with each other, uh, then we'll get a mixed up um, mixture. It's the natural order. It's just democracy, that's all. Democracy is enforced by dance crowds, by heat. This is where the role of heat comes in. If we are really frozen out, those five molecules in the corner of this room would uh, the 20% of oxygen in this room would concentrate in this corner of the room, let us say, if I had it there, and you would not be alive. You are alive because the oxygen is getting to you, because it's mixed up, and it's mi mixed up, and the heat has something to do with it. It's obvious from this scene that this crowd will get more mixed up uh, if a Cuban band, Van Van, is playing rather than some old-fashioned waltz. And so this is going to get more mixed up, and in a, it's the temperature that does the mixing. You can see here the distribution of molecular speeds, a classical part of physical chemistry, and you see that the higher the temperature, the larger the range of speeds that is available. That's all that I want to show. So temperature and entropy are connected to each other. So now I come to the, back to my definition. Entropy is not very difficult. It's natural. It's democratic. The only thing undemocratic in this, the, the entropy, if you don't have any entropy, that can only be at absolute zero. Otherwise, you will, or you will get a diminution of the effect of entropy. But at any reasonable temperature, in any process, there is a certain number of kilojoules that is expanded to heat a pot of water to boiling. The heat that's expanded when you turn on your gas stove is more than what is in that pot of water raised to boiling to boil an egg. It has been dissipated, and it is that which is ultimately the measure of uh, the of what uh, of how efficient a process is. Now, in measuring that, chemists have to get used to not just writing reactions as A plus B going to C plus D. For my friends in the audience, don't worry, I know about equilibrium. Uh, but um, most chemical reactions in this world that are run by human beings are perturbed out of equilibrium in order to give us what we desire. And we have ways to do that for the commercial processes. But the reactions have to be revised to put in the other energy that is in there, the energy input, which is, uh, uh, aside from the normal energy input, there is also labor, there are other costs, there is the medium in which the reaction is run, the solvent. And what one has to look at is what part of that can be used again afterwards. And what one has to take is, uh, in various steps, companies take a normally and understandably a gate-to-gate -gate approach. The chemicals that come in, the chemicals that go out. In a proper environmental analysis, you have to take more. You have to take a cradle-to-gate approach. That is, you have to see how much it takes to to uh, take out those natural substances and to convert them into what comes into the factory. And more and more you have to take a cradle-to-grave approach, meaning, of course, that you don't just dump the solvents into a pool, but you recover them or that you use them in some other way. All of this can be studied. I've given you an entropy measure there are other measures in the literature with names like exergy and emergy. I would say, despite the fact that books have been written about these, that these have not caught on, uh, even though they are very rational ways of looking 
and in an age of environmental decision making at looking at the energy costs. Uh, close the exergy is the closest uh, to the entropy that measure that I suggest. There are real problems in defining some of these things. Supposing you do focus on the heat added to the universe, the entropy data added to the universe, what do you do about labor uh, in that process? And most importantly, what do you do about ingenuity and intellectual property? How do you measure the entropy cost of uh, the energetic property, of the, ener of the intellectual property that goes into devising a new process and how do you measure the role of capital without such invest without whose investment uh, there would be no that without the entrepreneurial spirit they would not be any of this uh, these are all problems and this is where one needs the help of economists not to help you predict the stock market but to get you measures of intangible, of intangible things such as labor and human capital uh, and also of social costs and this is what Amartya Sen has specialized in. Let me talk a little bit about risk perception uh, which is the second component of such a multifaceted index and one which will not be reducible to a number and I, this is uh, what I want to talk about is the anticipation of dread, catastrophe, lack of control, lack of empowerment. All psychological factors doesn't seem like there could be much to a ceramic cup being made in terms of these, much more in terms of a chemical process, but even there in a ceramic cup, if looked at carefully. So I want to talk a little bit about the difference between risk assessment and risk perception. Risk assessment is what scientists and technologists are good at and what has to be built into the laws of our country. But risk perception is what human beings experience, a deeply psychological. I can put it in terms of if you don't know how to ski, if you're put on a pair of slippery wooden sticks down a 45 degree slope, that does not feel very good. Okay? But if you know how to ski, then it does. So there's a difference in the perception of the risk. Some of the degrees that psychologists have, some of the things that enter into risk perception rather than this assessment, very important one is the degree of control that you have over a risk factor. This is why subtly we feel much more in control of, our, of, our, of driving even when we've drunk a glass of wine. And we don't feel the same thing subtly, subconsciously about being in an airplane because it's not we who are driving. The other part is empowerment, that you, have some, that you have some control over this, over saying what the factors are. Something that's very peculiar to human beings, uh, maybe to other animals, is any risk that entails potential um, danger to children is viewed by us as a greater risk than the same danger uh, attached to adults. And there is extreme events. Extreme events where 100 people are killed have much more power than 100 events where one person is killed. And that's just in the nature of human beings and it has to be taken into account. Nuclear power, which arguably is uh, the best way to have solved the energy crisis, the day is past for Earth. Uh, because why is the day passed? Because even if we build a nuclear plant a day, we will not satisfy the energy needs of this world. Uh, but nuclear plant has uh, eradicable uh, nuclear power has eradicable uh, barriers to it and association with nuclear weapons. And these barriers come from risk perception, not from risk assessment. Uh, that it's association with the weapons 
the intangibility of the effects that we can't see the radiation coming at us, whereas we can see a car coming at us. Uh, it's distance from personal control, all those highly trained people, but it's not us. Um, and the inability to put a cost on what? Ten billion dollars have been spent on the Yucca uh, disposal facility, and we are still no nearer a solution in the United States about where to put our nuclear waste. And that these problems are, in my opinion, that's all it is, are a barrier that cannot be overcome. The third part is societal costs. Some estimate, some estimate of uh, how to, uh, of what the costs will be. Now, uh, on the risk perception, I already implied it, we have to seek the help of psychologists. On risk assessment, we can seek engineers, but no amount of risk assessment will work without the inputs of psychologists and of artists and writers. And that comes to the fore, most importantly, in societal costs, because the societal costs are inevitably looking ahead to a future and are almost by definition, um, almost by definition, impossible to, for, for uh, people to prognosticate. Small changes are parts of large interdependent complex systems. For instance, the liberation of women and their entry into the workforce in the past century. Into that have entered components as large as the perturbation of World Wars I and II on the workforce, uh, and as diverse and small as washing machines, vacuum cleaners, disposable diapers, and oral contraceptives. Now, when that change technological change couples with random actions and with geopolitical circumstances, it seems almost impossible to predict the consequences. Uh, what I just mentioned, disposable diapers are forming a large component of the landfills of America. It's who would have predicted that? In quite another matter, who would have predicted the role of text messaging and social networks on the Arab Spring of 2011? It was something that no one 10 years ago could imagine. So this doesn't absolve us from trying. I think what we need to do is we need to turn to those components of our community whose, if not job, but whose métier, whose uh, talent is at imagining the unimaginable. And interestingly enough, and I think sobering for scientists, is because it's no more than creative hypothesis forming, and as such might have been part of science, and is in part, but we have given it largely to artists and writers. They are the ones who imagine our future. And so they must be drawn in here. Uh, in, uh, when I think of the and historians also, when I think of Braudel's analysis of the importance, the importance that small changes in the environment of a middle, a person in medieval times could, could make in their living. When I think of Jared Diamond's incisive analysis, though controversial, of the way things have changed in this world. Uh, I see this is what I mean by history and ge geology, and geography at its best. But then when I read, for instance, Margaret Atwood's speculative uh, fictions, uh, The Handmaiden's Tain, Tale, Oryx and Crake, uh, The Year of the Flood, I do not know of any single better imagining of what our ecological future is going to than, than what is found in these novels. 
and Ursula Le Guin's imagining of the, of the anthropology and ethnography of meeting up with different cultures is, is a, really the best imaginative fiction that you could have. So I think we, the scenarios reaching for a future are to be found in the names of artists. So here are the faces of green. So what I imagine is, first of all, this is not a dream which I am going to live out because it'll take a big institute and there's no money for it, which will combine all these people to construct such an index. But we should, we should dream, why not? To realize this dream will take a multinational effort and it'll involve both scientists, technologists, and humanists historians and artists, for sure. It is, in its multifaceted nature, at least the one good and realistic thing about it is that the computer has wrought this multifaceted nature uh, into our environment. So let, let me be specific. Here is, someone brings a new cup. It's going to be made of some biodegradable plastic, okay? and they're going to try to sell it for us. And of course, they're going to sell it. They're going to say this is going to cure all the problems. It also happens to be infused with an anti-tumor agent, which is working on you while you're drinking in this cup. Okay, so it goes into this imagined index, that, and it's a computer-based index, and the computer is talking to you while you put in that cup, and it says, it asks some questions, first of all. It's a, I mean, they're, they're obvious questions. What will this cup be made of? Yes, it's very nice to say it's a new biodegradable polymer, but if you tell it that, it'll ask you, what is that biodegradable polymer? And we run into an interesting world of patents and how much you reveal and how much you conceal. Patents are a game. In, on this, uh, and then it'll ask you how many cups do you want to make of this, all on a computer screen, engaged in a dialogue with the people who seek the patent. And when you answer enough questions, it'll give you an answer of some sort, which will never be very precise, and this is again where I cringe at this number. It looks to us as if this process will add 160 kilojoules. I've just made this up uh, to the universe and gives you a comparison and it gives you a way to look things up uh, of how they did it. It's not easy to look things up. Uh, some of us will remember the Club of Rome predictions about how the earth will run down in 10 or 20 years. It has not happened when people have looked at what it is, an early example of the modeling of a complex system. And the, those are well hidden, the analyses and how they're done. So one has to provide people with the answers. Then there comes in a, the cup rotates. I hope you've noticed the cup has rotated, but that's what the computers are good for. And the cup has rotated, and out comes another screen in which there is a risk assessment and a risk perception analysis of what happens. And this is done uh, perhaps increasingly more in terms of pictures rather than numbers. And the, into those pictures, as I've mentioned, come this is the work of psychologists. And then comes another face of the cup. I'm just not good enough at computer graphics to have actually rotated the cup. And so there is an estimate through imagined scenarios with, as I've said, the contribution of artists and of historians into some of the societal costs. And of course, this will be great fun to read just like time capsules are 10 years after the fact, because half of them will make no sense whatsoever and will have worried about the wrong things. But at least somebody will have worried. 
And that somebody who will have worried is not a scientist. And I like that. Because that is ultimately what we have to experience in our society. So this is uh, my dream. Uh, my dream is uh, that there, there be essential change. We have to have essential change. I've already told you that we, we, are go we are transforming this world. We are bound to transform it further in various ways. We have no good ways of anticipating how we will transform this world. You can see with what the internet in our time has wrought in terms of real transformation and of legal questions around intellectual property, uh, around invasion of privacy. All of these things, could one have envisaged? Yes, some people envisaged it. But uh, I think one has to worry about it. Part of the worrying is a transformation index which I would like to see in terms of the entropy added to the universe, which I think ultimately is the, me the, the last measure. And that's the wasted heat that you do. But I also believe that a new, a new vision of the transformation will involve also considerations of risk perception as well as assessment, and will, it's complicated, and will also involve the visions of artists about the world that we will see in the future. But we'll see how it plays out. Thank you. Thank you for this very thoughtful talk. Um, there, there will be time for a few questions if you are prepared to sure. end. So, um, if one were to try to make a model for what leads to the price of a commodity, it's almost all, many of the same issues would be there. Right. Okay. So, wouldn't a solution be that we would simply have a way of putting prices on waste? Yes. And I think uh, most economists come ultimately to a price uh, as the measure. And that is certainly the way to put in labor and ingenuity, which I mentioned were two of the problems, the intellectual property. So. And risk also, to, though that is a little unforeseen, the risk and the societal effects. We can see how the unwillingness to, to consider prognoses of risk has gotten various companies, these are case studies in business school, into trouble, whether it's... Uh, breast implants for uh, Dow Corning, uh, or whether it is um, various, uh, the f various pharmaceuticals for Merck, Sharp, and Dome. Uh, they have brought companies down, the inability, and then with it the natural tendency to also hide risk and to sweep things under the rug. This is where the empowerment that we feel we know that what is there this is also where ethics will come in. Ethics and science, I believe, are in a marriage of uh, necessity, if not convenience, for in the next millennium. We, we have to consider ethical questions in what we do. You are only... Is there a question there from a student? Um, perhaps I, I misunderstood, but you emphasize, you want an, an index, a number, a numerical measure, but you're keen to include the uh, visions of writers. Yes. 
How do you propose to quantify the visions of writers? Not, I will not quantify them. Oh, okay, okay. Uh -huh. so that's where the computer comes in. It actually, one is the index, and I'm worried that some people will stop in my vision of this cup or whatever object it is. I'm worried that some people, reporters and people, will stop at one index for that. But then, and that the other things are inherently not quantifiable as many things in this world are that make us happy or unhappy. But, and, um, and how can they be included as part of the measure? Yes. I, I imagine this cup being rotated and on comes a, some a scenario of what might happen with this uh, that a theater improvisation troupe will do. I mean, here is, here is what... People are making biomimetic adhesives based on the way that muscles adhere to uh, the moorings uh, on a dock. We've all noticed that. They stick very well. So I can just imagine a theater improv group having a lot of fun with this. But what if you make a super adhesive? Well, you can get into a lot of trouble with a super adhesive. Uh, and Part of it is the fun, but part is the serious. I would urge them in both directions. I imagine several uh, playwrights taking this problem, this seemingly dry problem, and trying to construct a little five-minute play around it. So this yeah. union uh, that you have described between science ethics, psychology, literature. Uh, in terms of making progress sooner rather than later, what impact do you think this has on university science education? Well, uh, the, the question was uh, in terms of this vision which unites these, which some of you will recognize, of course, is what, I, what my life is about. Um, what impact does university education have? I think that uh, I think that an education of technologists and scientists in the humanities and in the arts is absolutely necessary. I think this is the in important export of the American system that the Asian societies, which are modeling themselves on the American system, have neglected. And this is a humanistic education. And uh, you can say uh, that you sh maybe you read that novel in gymnasium. And so, because everyone in the world does secondary school education better than America. Um, but, so uh, maybe you read that novel, but there's a difference between reading Madame Bovary when you're 16 and when you're 20. And the difference is you've probably fallen in love between those ages. And uh, so it means different things to you. So I, th I, think there, there, I think the ideal of a general education with a healthy dose of the humanities and the arts for young people in the formative stage in which they are becoming scientists is important. It was important for me. <laughs>